Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. I think you can. Uh, my name is Todd Nielsen. I'm a long-term member here at the temple. Tonight's talk is a meditation on the five aggregates with Monte Yoga, Yoga Wachara Rahula. Monte Rahula was born in Southern California as Scott Dupre in 1948. He became a Buddhist, Buddhist monk in 1975 at Gotama Tapovanaya in Sri Lanka. He lived at the Bhavana Society in West Virginia from 1986 until 2010. I believe that is Bhante Gunaratana's center in West Virginia there. Bhante Rahula is now the director and principal teacher at the Lion of Wisdom Meditation Center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So welcome Bhante Rahula. Uh, what is the format you want to have the guided meditation first and then pardon uh, what is the format you want to have the guided meditation first followed by the Dhamma talk that's right we usually start with the uh, half hour meditation or so and then the Dhamma talk and then we'll stop an hour from now with some questions. Okay. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and try to sit straight. Try to keep your back and the head in a straight line. Just place your hands either on one on top of the other in your lap or resting on your legs. Just gently close the eyes. And first of all, just move your attention down to feel where your buttocks and feet press the floor. Just feel that weight of the body pressing the floor. And just remind yourself of sitting, sitting. Just feel those sensations of the body and feet pressing the floor. Now feel your hands and fingers where they touch your legs or where they touch together. Try to feel the outline of your thumbs or fingers. to feel the subtle pulsation or sensations in the hands. Now feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Relax the shoulders. Try to feel where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders or arms. And now feel the head balanced on top of the neck. You keep your chin raised up level to the floor. And just rest your attention just behind the eyes. Just feel the eyes resting in the, so the socket. Feel the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. Just feel the different sensations on your face. Sensations of the skin stretched over the front of the skull. Any little prickling sensations.
Feel the lips touching together. Feel the tongue laying in the mouth. And still resting the attention behind the eyes. Try to expand the awareness to feel the outline of the sitting body. The general sense of the head on top, the shoulders, arms, buttocks and feet pressing the floor. sort of a men mental silhouette, the sitting body. Means remind yourself of sitting, sitting. And now begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take about three seconds to Expand your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs two or three seconds. Allow the oxygen to get into the bloodstream. And feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. And feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs. Let's take a few more deep, slow breaths like that, cultivating this basic mindfulness. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. And breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, Feeling the whole body. Now we're going to count the breaths from one to ten to try to develop a more continuous concentration on the breathing. Try to keep taking some slightly deeper breaths to help you concentrate. With the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Feel the brief pause with the contracting out breath, also count to one. Feel the last bit of air go out of the lung. The next in breath, two. Out breath, two. In breath, three. Out breath, three. In four. Out. Four. In five. Out five. 
in six. Out six. In seven. Out seven. In eight. Out eight. In nine. Out nine. In ten. Out ten. Now discontinue the counting. Let the breathing return to its uncontrolled, shorter, irregular rhythm. We continue to feel it. Keep the attention focused in the middle of the body. Feel the subtler expanding and contracting sensations. Try to feel where the clothing rubs against the skin of the stomach, rib cage, or chest as it expands and contracts. That's what you mostly feel. And just know when the breath is coming in. And knowing when the breath is going out, you know it by feeling it. Try to notice the four phases of each breath cycle, the expanding in breath and the brief pause. The contracting out breath in the brief pause. Just over and over and over again. If it helps you to stay focused, you can use these mental notes of simply in, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting, breath by breath, moment by moment. In the brief pauses between the breaths, to feel the outline of the sitting body. This breathing body is the natural connection to the present moment awareness. Try to have the feeling of being a scientist in a laboratory looking down through the microscope of concentrated awareness. Try 
to observe the breathing process. Try to notice how each breath is different, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes you feel it more in the abdomen, sometimes you feel it more in the rib cage or chest. It's always changing. Be alert for any other sensations arising in the body, itching or prickling sensations, aches or pains. Just let them be there in the background. Be alert for any thoughts sneaking up into the mind. Just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Just keeping the sensations of the breathing body in the front of the awareness. In, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. This breathing body is the natural connection. The present moment. If we lose that connection to the present moment, the breathing body, and the mind gets easily distracted, pushed and pulled between the past and future thinking, or caught up in desires, aversions, ego centered thoughts. This breathing body is like the life preserver, the lifeline to the present moment. Just try to feel more and more subtle sensations in the breathing body. Turn up the power of the mental microscope. Concentrated awareness.
Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Sensations come and go. Pleasure or pain come and go. Thoughts, urges, emotions come and go. Thoughts of I, me, and mine come and go. These are all just the, the five aggregates of the body, mind, and their flow of impermanence. Just beneath all of that change and permanence or mental chaos is the parallel dimension of the now, of the present moment awareness. It's not affected by any of the comings and goings of impermanence. The mind gets lost or carried away in thinking, recognize it as thinking, thinking. Gently let go of the thoughts, take a deep, slow breath, bring the mind back into the body. Back to in, in, sitting. Out, out. Sitting.
things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. When one sees this with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. And thus, the Buddha. And now place your hands at the edge of your knees. And take a deep, slow breath. As you breathe in, stretch your head back. Pull the hands against the knees, arch the spine a little. And lift the head up on an in breath and on the out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebra. Lift the head up level on an in breath and relax on the out breath. Okay, friends, uh, so now uh, this evening I was asked to give a, a talk about the five aggregates. And I'm probably most of you have heard about the five aggregates in one way or another, but uh, especially in, uh, you know, the mind, practice of mindfulness and the Buddhist teaching, actually the the five aggregates uh, occupy the central core of wisdom and understanding, and also about dukkha. Even when the Buddha defined suffering, he said, you know, birth, old age, age you know, sickness and death is suffering. And he said, getting what you want and not getting getting what you don't want is also suffering. And then he said, in short, uh, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. So the uh, five aggregates basically, you know, a lot of people think it's just some kind of a theory, but actually it's, it's everything we could possibly experience. And it's our it's our body and mind and the world around us, but especially our body and mind. And it's the, the main focus of the practice of mindfulness and especially of the Vipassana meditation. Uh, and the, so these five aggregates basically are the material uh, aggregate, what are called form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, but basically the form means all the material vibrations in the world, including the material elements of this body, as well as the external 
world that make up uh, you know matter and so on and the feelings are the pleasant painful neutral feelings that arise whenever we contact the material vibrations so even when you were sitting in the last half hour meditation you probably had some uncomfortable uh, sensations arise which belong to the aggregate of feeling or you could have you might have had some uh, pleasant uh, feeling arise if you happen to get some ment some calmness and concentration you might have had a pleasant feeling which is a mental uh, phenomenon and you might have had uh, perceptions uh, just to recognize that you're sitting and breathing is also a perception and then the volitional formations are our various actions and urges and thoughts and emotions uh, are all included within the volitional formations and then the consciousness is the knowing faculty the fact that we can hear see taste smell touch and think the consciousness is sort of the light of the mind but normally this consciousness is uh, under the influence of i me and mine so with every arising of consciousness there's the idea of i am hearing seeing tasting smelling touching or thinking i am feeling this or this is me look at me give it to me or this is mine 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 so almost everything we do has the uh the idea of me and mine together and usually we you know it's our consciousness that a person you know usually takes to be their you know their self uh and they're identified with that anyway so these five aggregates uh these are undergoing constant change uh, you know even millions of times in a second these all these uh, uh, sensations and thoughts mental activity are arising and vanishing in the flow of impermanence and you're probably familiar with the three characteristics of existence are the uh, anicca dukkha and anatta or impermanence suffering and no self and this refers to these uh, same uh, five aggregates that they're always uh, constantly in change and because they're constantly changing uh, we cannot hold on to them and when they change then we uh, suffer and we identify these aggregates as being uh, again i me and mine so we look in the mirror and we see this uh, the material vibration that you're looking at in the mirror or you're watching this screen right now and you see this image uh, on your screen but really it's just a material vibration uh, coming onto your eyes and that's the the form but it's just a material vibration but then the mind recognizes that particular form as a certain object in this case let's say uh, you're thinking oh bhante rahula or the buddha image there in the background uh, that's the perception so a perception is the way the mind recognizes objects because the material vibration are just atoms and molecules basically and this is just basic physics so that anything you experience this body is just made up of cells molecules atoms electrons basically it's just a electromagnetic field and any physicist can tell you that uh, so basically the material forms are just material vibrations but it's the perception that uh, makes those material vibrations into a uh, a specific object that you recognize from when you were a child growing up and you're learning language your mother and father said that's a doggy that's a kitty that's 
mommy, that's daddy, and all these objects of the world as you grew up, grow up, you know, the mind is giving them names and labels, and that's how you recognize them. So those are perceptions. And all these uh, perceptions and material vibrations, you experience as it's either something pleasant or something unpleasant, or many of them are, are neutral uh, sensations. And these are not just uh, the physical body, but it's, you know, anything that you see, hear, smell, taste, feel on the body, uh, or even think about, these belong to the aggregate of rupa. Well, not that you think about, but those five material uh, vibrations. And, and all of them are simply just electromagnetic vibrations uh, moving through the, uh, the atmosphere in the universe, coming through your senses. And then your brain then takes those and forms a picture of it because of memory. And then we, we, uh, we cling to that. Uh, we, we don't see the process working. We, we cling to these objects as being something absolutely uh, real. And also the feelings the painful and pleasant feelings, we get affected by those. And we develop greed and a desire for pleasurable feelings. And we have aversion, or get angry and have aversion uh, to the painful uh, feelings or any, any object or any person that brings a painful feeling to you then that also triggers off the uh, mental formation. So the mental formations are the reactions to the uh, feelings and the perceptions. So, you know, every time you see something, uh, for example, say, oh, I, I don't, don't wanna see that. Let's say you see a, a dead animal on the side of the road or maybe even see a dead person, uh, you know, in a car accident or, you know, then you, that aversion, that kind of pulling away, it's painful because it reminds ourselves of our own impermanence. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's uh, the unpleasant uh, sensation and it triggers this, uh, the, the body to, let's say, pull its head away. Or if you have an itch, you, you reach up to scratch it because of that unpleasant feeling. So the feelings and the perceptions are what trigger off our reactions. So the mental formations basically are the reactions. So, so far we have the material aggregate are just the, the vibrations. I like to just call them vibrations because that's what they are. Even if you hear a sound, it's just a sound vibration moving through your nervous system and then it's registered in your brain as being uh, the monk talking or the dog barking or any other sound uh, and these are constantly arising and vanishing through our body and mental process uh, it is said to, to the 10 to the 24th power now you can crunch some numbers and uh, you know Imagine what the 10 to the 24th power, how many millions that is. Uh, that's how many times in a second or the blink of an eye that this mental process is going on. So we don't see that process occurring because our consciousness is very slow. Now the fourth, the fifth aggregate is the consciousness itself. And that's simply the knowing faculty. Uh, it's basically the light of the mind that allows us to, to have experience. Uh, but most people take this, their consciousness as being I, me, and mine. And they, they, you know, they identify with that. And they, they identify with all the, the objects uh, that we have, that we have the memory of it. And so when these objects change, we suffer and we can't control them. <clears throat> so all these, these five uh, groups, 
form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness are subject to impermanence and subject to uh, or undergoing birth and death every moment. But we normally don't see that. And so actually the, uh, you know, the practice of Vipassana meditation is actually a specific uh, mental training in which we train our mind to tune in to uh, that process of moment to moment process of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. And to go back to the consciousness for a moment, the consciousness, I mean, it's uh, a, one of the better analogies for consciousness. It's like the a roll of film, you know, in the old uh, r uh, movie rolls, the film, the movie was made up of individual frames pictures, and they had a space in between. So you have a big roll of film and you put it in a projector. And then it's running through the projector fast. We don't see the spaces in between the, the pictures. And it's run through fast, so it, it appears to be a smooth flowing uh, scene that's going on and then, then we get you know involved uh, with it but if you run that projector on slow motion if you've ever seen a slow you know, movie in slow motion then you you kind of you can see that staccato like uh movement and that's the impermanence but normally we don't see that because our mind is, uh, operates too slowly. Our mind uh, is a very slow. Our rate of perception is very slow because of our clinging and attachment. At any one time, there are millions of vibrations coming through our senses. Even in the body itself, there are millions of cells vibrating that uh, you could feel if you had, you know, microscopic uh, concentration. And uh, there's also many hundreds and thousands of sounds and other things coming through the senses. But our brain is a filter and filters out only the things that are sort of important to us, how we've been brought up and trained. Our mind focuses on these particular ones and our little world is uh, created around that. And all the other 99% of thousands and millions of sensory vibrations that are also coming and going at the same time, they're filtered out. And so we don't see them. So actually in Vipassana meditation, the training is to learn how to tune into that. And actually the four foundations of mindfulness, I think you all you know, know about the four foundations of mindfulness. Well, this is the Buddha's teaching on developing this kind of uh, understanding. And, the, you know, the mindfulness of the body, we train ourselves to see the body as just the four elements and uh, is in a constant state of change. And then the, the contemplation of feelings, how quickly the feelings, pleasant and painful and neutral, uh, sensations uh, are constantly coming through. But normally we cling to the sensations. So we, we get attached to only a few of them and the rest of them go by kind of in the background. And uh, so, and then our mental states too. Uh, there's so many thoughts that are constantly moving through the unconscious mind but only the ones that we're most attached to, they, they arise and we grab at these and uh, then we get carried away uh, and take actions, create our karma, you know, based on these. So this understanding of the ag aggregates, I mean, that means our body and mind process is, and how we're, we uh, have become deluded by them and caught in the, uh, 
in the attraction or the aversion to these five aggregates. And basically our whole life revolves around painful and pleasant sensations. And from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night, 99% of all of your thoughts, speech, and actions are being influenced by the uh, pleasant sensations, wanting to get hold of pleasant sensations, or if you have them, to keep on holding them, to uh, protect them, to try to increase them, or the opposite, uh, being disturbed by unpleasant sensations and trying to scheme and plan how are you going to keep the unpleasant sensations from coming uh, to you. So, because all the perceptions have a pleasant or a painful or a, a sort of quality to it. The neutral ones, we don't notice the neutral sensations too much, but it's the pleasant and painful ones that really grab our mind and that we create most of our karma around uh, trying to get a hold of pleasurable uh, sensations and objects and get away from the painful ones. And we, this, is, this is not a rocket science. I mean, you can easily observe this uh, going on almost all the time. Uh, in your body and mind, whenever you're looking around, seeing things, smelling things, you can, you can see this process. But most people just take it for granted and they say, "Yeah, so what?" You know. But uh, you know, they remain trapped by that. And the Buddha, you know, recommended people to, you know, to to see the the gratification in the the five aggregates. You know, there are pleasurable feelings that come with, you know, these five aggregates, and that's why people get attached to them. But there's also the painful qualities, and when those pleasant sensations go away, they're usually replaced by neutral sensations or other painful sensations arise. And the, most of a person's life is just a tug of war going back and forth, uh, struggling and getting affected by the impermanence of these, uh, you know, the, the body and the mind. When something happens to your body, you get worried and, uh, you know, uh, agitated and, and uh, so many other uh, problems. And all these things, we can see that they're constantly changing. So the, uh, that's why, you know, they're, they form the basis of uh, the wisdom. And especially of the no self. I mean, we can basically understand how things are constantly changing. We can understand how we uh, suffer on account of them when they change and we don't want them to change. Uh, then we feel dejected or we feel sad. And, uh, and then when the, the, the painful feelings to us, we, we get irritated by them. We can't control these uh, feelings. So none of these aggregates are under the, con that we can really control. And this is how the, the Buddha sort of you know, applied his deductive reasoning to understand these, these five aggregates. He asked the, the monks, are, you know, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, are these things uh, impermanent and always changing? And they said, yes. And then he said, well, if things are constantly changing and you can't uh, have them or control them because of changing, is, is that uh, a perfect state? And they said, no. And then he said, well, if whatever is impermanent and constantly changing and a, and a, a source of suffering, is it right to call that, that is me, that is mine, and that is myself. And he said, uh, no. So anyway, uh, not to belabor the point, uh, you know, the five aggregates, uh, when we practice the meditation, uh, we're, you know, it's easier to see the impermanence 
And then because of the impermanence, uh, we can see how the mind gets affected by that and suffers because of that. And, uh, but the, the illusion of the ego is the hardest thing to see to the consciousness, to see the impermanence of the consciousness. And that's why Vipassana meditation is a very specific method in which you train yourself to speed up the rate of perception. Instead of concentrating on one object, you open up the awareness and start tuning in to the moments of hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching that are you know, arising and vanishing, coming and going. And it depends on the strength of your concentration, mindfulness and concentration. They have to be developed to a certain extent in order to be able to effectively observe this flow of impermanence without the mind getting uh, overwhelmed by it. So that's why a certain amount of concentration and mindfulness uh, is needed before one can effectively uh, develop this kind of vipassana uh, awareness and to see how quickly uh, these moments are uh, arising and vanishing and as they build up speed because the ego the sense of i is in direct proportion to the amount of clinging or attachment you have to any of these uh, aggregates. And so the, the more you're paying attention to any of these aggregates, the sense of I builds up. And also they're made up of the past and the future. The ego exists because of the past and the future. So as long as we're identifying, normally we experience these aggregates, we remember them from the past and we project them into the future. And our mind is constantly going between the past and the future. And most people have no idea what the present moment is really. But the present moment is a dimension of our, the, the, the pure consciousness. When the consciousness is not grasping and clinging to any of the things coming through the senses, then the, the past and the future connected with those objects also uh, d dissolves from the mind. And you can have a, a direct immediate experience of present moment awareness. Now people can get these experiences in meditation, normally they cannot maintain them very long. Uh, but in the Vipassana practice, that is a eventually sort of what we're uh, developing that uh, that uh, perception of impermanence to see how quickly these mind moments you know, hearing seeing tasting smelling touching and thinking are arising and vanishing and when that builds up sufficient speed then the sense of I starts to dissolve because again, the I is, remains strong only when there's the, the past and the future to react to. And so uh, by not clinging to any of the objects, the, even the idea of past and future dissolves and the sense of I dissolves within the consciousness. And that's when you get the the insights into no self and so on. And you could, one of my favorite little bit of analogies of the ego consciousness is an ice cube. Let's say you have an ice cube floating in water. Now the ice cube is also made up of the water, but it appears to be something different than the water. So the ice cube thinks it's different from the water. But if you add some, put some heat uh, to that water or just sitting it long enough, uh, then that ice cube starts to melt. Then, then 
it, you know, it just becomes part of the water. And there's no more ice cube. So the same way, when the sense of I dissolves in the mind, you experience this unity kind of uh, awareness or present moment awareness that has gone beyond the subject and object dualistic thinking and has and is, uh, gone beyond, uh, you know, uh, suffering or it's, you know, perfect uh, contentment because all problems of the world are based on the past and the future. Think of any problem that you might have and see if it's not connected to the past or future in one way or another. Uh, so you probably have a hard time, you know, doing that. So anyway, I'm just uh, mentioning these things because uh, this is how the Vipassana meditation is gradually uh, developed to a very high degree. Now, a lot of people rarely uh, get to that point uh, because it takes a lot of uh, uh, training and mental training and uh, the practice of meditation to, to be able to sustain that kind of mindfulness and concentration and developing the wisdom. So ultimately, you know, wisdom uh, refers to this direct penetration of the, the emptiness of the, the ego consciousness and the liberation from it. <clears throat> okay, so I know that the five aggregates is a very, uh, you know, complex uh, subject and uh, it's, uh, you know, most people don't really uh, get into that because uh, usually it takes going on a long retreat of two or three weeks where you're really in a very uh, uh, controlled uh, kind of uh, environment where you can move very, very mindfully and, and have no distractions at because it's like uh, turning up the, the power of a microscope. So Vipassana meditation is like a scientist sitting in a laboratory. And this body is the laboratory. And the mind is the, elect, uh, is the microscope. The concentrated awareness is the microscope. And we're observing concentration. The more you're concentrated, it's like turning up the power of a microscope from the power of five to the power of 10, to the power of 20, to the power of 50, to the power of 100, 200, up to 500, 1,000. And then it becomes an electron microscope. It even smashes the atom. And that's when you experience emptiness, when the mind is no longer forming perceptions out of the material uh, vibrations, which are just basically electromagnetic vibrations. Uh, and, the, and the perception process has been suspended and you experience that uh, uh, transcendental state. Anyway, uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, you know, share that whole process with you because a lot of people, they've been meditating for a long time and they may be practicing Anapanasati, they may be practicing Metta, and then they ask, you know, what's next? You know, and they get to a point where their, their meditation is pretty comfortable and they're kind of just hanging out and they have some blissful sensations and uh, so on. They can endure their, you know, pains for a long time. And then they kind of think, well, what's next? Well, that's what's next is you have to redouble your efforts not to get trapped by the bliss or comfort that uh, some initial concentration is giving you. And you have to double down the efforts to, to tune in to the, uh, you know, the flow of impermanence and cultivate this insight into uh, the Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta of the five uh, uh, aggregates. It means if you're following the, uh, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness and cultivating the uh, seven factors of enlightenment, that's exactly how it's, uh, it is uh, cultivated by developing this kind of uh, investigation of the Dhamma.
You've heard an investigation of Dhamma. What is the Dhamma you're investigating? It's none other than the five aggregates. So friends, anyway, uh, I think I'll wind up this uh, talk and uh, I, let's see if uh, there's any questions that might have uh, come up from uh, this, uh, this talk. Okay, there's a, there's a question here from a Dennis. I think I know this person. It says, uh, would you say the parallel dimension of present moment awareness is unperturbed by sansara? Well, that present moment awareness, if it's really the truly present moment awareness where the, the, the sense of I is, is also faded away, uh, the sansara it means the wandering of the mind. So the mind has stopped its wandering at that time and it stopped being affected by pleasure and pain. So yes, it's, not, it's unperturbed by temporarily you have uh, sort of suspended that sansaric process to a great degree. Only the arahant or fully enlightened person has really brought the uh, sansaric process to a, a, a halt. Uh, and especially after that person dies, but even because there's two types of uh, liberation. There's a liberation when you still have the five aggregates. And then there's the liberation when uh, that enlightened person finally passes uh, away. But yeah, in the in the in that deep state of present moment awareness where the thoughts of past and future have sort of vanished in the in you know at least 99% of the sense of I has vanished, then it's not being disturbed by any of these aggregates that are coming and going. And it's the aggregates coming and going, that is the sensata basically. Uh, let's see if there's any other. I don't see any other chat. Anyone in the temple has a question? They must use this microphone. Okay, here's a here's a question. Uh, Hi. So, what happens when okay. all perceptions stop and they're not arising anymore? What happens after that? When you get to that point. Uh, well, all perceptions are not going to uh, cease unless you reach a, 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 the, the eighth jhana or the fourth formless jhana of the cessation of feeling and perception. Or uh, if you have attained the Niroda, uh, the, the niroda Samapati. So but the perceptions of ordinary things cease and you, your perceptions become very, very refined. So the perception of present moment awareness, that's also a perception, but it's so refined that the gross perceptions have ceased. And so even in the jhanas, uh, actually that's what one of this next question in the chat box is, is talking about. Uh, so the, it's not that the all uh, perceptions are going to cease. We, we stop clinging to the perceptions. And the feelings and the perceptions are not going to cease until you've reached this level of Niroda Samapati, which most people are not going to uh, reach. Uh, or if you've uh, attained uh, the, uh, you know, even the Buddha, he, he, he was, he was in Nibbana for 45 years, but he still had perceptions, but he had no clinging to the perceptions. That's the main difference. Uh, so even the enlightened person has form, feeling, perceptions, volition, and consciousness, but he's not clinging to them as I, me, or mine. And therefore they don't disturb the mind. The suffering has ceased. The aggregates don't cease. The suffering has ceased with them because of the ignorance, the, purification of greed, hatred, and delusion uh, is the end of suffering. So uh, now this question uh, 
Now, what is the difference or similarity between vipassana meditation and the achievement of levels of jhana? So the uh, the jhanas are, you know, the train the the levels of tranquility. Now the problem is that we 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 need the jhanas to to effectively practice vipassana meditation, but they're called vipassana jhanas. So there's two types of jhana you can attain. One is where you take a particular object, let's say such as your breathing, and you focus exclusively on that. And so if you're successful, then you would overcome the five hindrances and the mind would be totally absorbed in that uh, sensation of breathing or the namita that it caused maybe some inner light or some object, the mind gets totally absorbed and it basically it loses its awareness of things going on uh, around you. Uh, and that's why people experience this very, very deep sort of uh, bliss. And it depends on how many levels of jhana you go through. Now, a lot of people get stuck in the jhana and they just want to hang out with that bliss. And so they don't go on to develop the insight into anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So the jhana, what's called a vipassana jhana is you don't concentrate on one object. You concentrate on arising and vanishing, uh, as I already mentioned. So once you've attained some concentration, it doesn't have to be a jhana, but if you attain the first jhana, fine, but you don't get stuck in the jhana. From that jhana, you deliberately tune in to the uh, arising and vanishing of sight, sound, smell, taste, and the other senses. So you don't close down the senses. Uh, and that's the difference. Uh, and so that's often called vipassana jhana, uh, that you, oh, by, by tuning in to mo the momentary comings and goings of the you know, the, the mind moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. You also overcome the hindrances and that becomes your vitaka and vichara. That becomes the applied and sustained attention to the flow of impermanence. So it's called vipassana jhana. So in that state, uh, they're, they're similar. Uh, but if you're practicing jhana, <clears throat> and especially if you practice the formless jhanas, then you're in a place where you're not feeling any flow of impermanence or the external distractions. So it, it, it all depends on how you let your, how you develop these jhanas if you're doing it just to sort of shut out the world and enter into this uh, extreme uh, quietude and so on. And people get stuck in that. Uh, and in that case, it's not much different than a drug. So you have the Buddha never advised people to do that, really, unless you use those jhanas as a basic basis for insight, but then it becomes vipassana jhana. But a lot of people don't do that. Uh, so that's uh, one of the main differences. We Thank need jhana to practice vipassana. Uh, but uh, it has to be that using, still uh, contemplating the impermanence and so on, and eventually coming to the, the realization of no self. Thank you very much, Bhante Rahul. I think we've run out of time. Uh, uh, right. Okay. Uh, very interesting talk. I want to um, ooh, I want to make some announcements here for the chapter. actually. Can I just make one announcement if people are interested in this? Sure. On Wednesday night on my own uh, YouTube channel, uh, this Wednesday night I'm going to be actually giving a talk on this advanced vipassana meditation, the eight insight knowledges, which is the practice of advanced vipassana uh, meditation. And so, if people are interested. Uh, that's at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And you can go on our uh, website and uh, get the link to the, or the Lion of Wisdom YouTube channel. It may be uh, being on YouTube live, right? Also, uh, that's on this Wednesday night at 7 
o'clock uh, Eastern time. Anyway, okay. I just wanted to. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, now for some now for some uh, announcements for here. Tomorrow morning we will have a meditation from 10 to 11 a.m. right here. This Wednesday, October 20th, from 7 to 8 p.m., Brother Billy Tan will be discussing the four mindful realities of stress, which we will also be streaming live on Zoom, as well as here at the temple in person. If you would like to attend via Zoom, please register on Eventbrite, and the link will be emailed to you one hour prior to meditation. Be sure to mark your calendars for this year's New Year blessing taking place on December 11th from 4 to 7 p.m. We will be having many monks visiting from all over the country. If you would like to help sponsor one of them or more of them and help with travel expenses, and as a gift of gratitude, you may do so online or in the gift shop. The suggested donation is $150 to pay for airline tickets, or you could also uh, donate less or more. We also have a table set up in the social hall if you wish to donate finger foods as well. And finally, please sign up for our email blast so that you will keep up to date with all of our events. That's in the spiral notebook. Thank you once again, Bhante Rahula. Very interesting talk and very informative. You're welcome. And don't forget, mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away. <laughs> well said. Thank you.